All right, so we'll get started. So hi, everyone. I'm Taylor Jaworski uh, from the Economics Department. So I'm going to introduce Chris Michener over here uh, for this event sponsored by the Benson Center for Western Civilization here at the University of Colorado. So I just want to give a little bit of introduction to Chris. For those of you who don't know, many of you, you do know Chris, but um, for those of you who don't, so Chris received his undergraduate and graduate degrees in economics um, at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's currently at the University or Santa Clara University, where he's a professor and holds an endowed chair in the economics department and business school. Uh, so to give you a little sense of kind of Chris's background uh, in terms of uh, his research, so he's kind of an economic historian broadly focused on macroeconomics and monetary policy uh, with uh, some economic growth thrown in there. In particular, he's an expert on the development of the U.S. financial system and has made uh, many of the most important recent contributions to our understanding of the effects of the 1930s Great Depression in the United States and around the world. Um, so that's kind of some background for Chris uh, on ter in terms of the, his research. Today, he's going to talk about another um, area of his work, sort of ongoing, that's sort of at the intersection of finance and political reform. And so you can think about uh, some, of the, some of the current relevance of this work as sort of stemming from, you know, you hear words like securitization of the economy or financialization of the economy, and that's usually not uh, meant to denote or connote uh, good things. Uh, it's sort of synonymous with corruption. And so today, Chris is going to talk about um, a way in which those things can happen that can facilitate political reform. In particular, he's going to talk about sort of a, a kind of securitization or financialization of the economy that took place uh, in feudal Japan that helped that economy transform uh, and become, I think, the first uh, um, uh, non-Western um, offshoot to experience sort of modern economic growth. Um, and sort of the relevance for the sort of the Benson Center and, the, and sort of Western civilization here is that, you know, Meiji Japan the, the, the political unit that's implementing these reforms um, was, was, was one of the first non-Western countries to grow uh, in a sustained way. Um, but this happened in part because Meiji Japan uh, sort of with great facility adopted, borrowed uh, sort of Western best, best practices in building its financial institutions. And so Chris is going to talk about one way in which sort of that came about in which it mattered a lot for Japan and economic growth. So that, take it away, Chris. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the, um, the center, the Benson Center, for inviting me, as well as the economics department. And um, so this is, uh, as, as Taylor gave, an excellent introduction. Uh, it probably needs a little more of an introduction than this. But um, let me start out by saying this is a story about institutional learning and about trying to understand uh, uh, deep problems in political economy. So about trying to come up with solutions to uh, how we implement reforms that are going to be sustainable. That if we could identify, in theory, if we could identify best practice reforms, how would we go about building coalitions to support those? So over the course of this uh, talk, I want to um, relate these four pictures. So we'll just start out with the pop quiz. What, what is the picture on the left? Samurai, right? Everyone knows a samurai. With the, you know, they had the traditional two swords. You see the two swords? That's they have the right to wear two swords. And so we're going to be talking a lot about samurai. That's a that's a, a status symbol, by the way. So to to both to have the right to bear arms as well as to have two swords is a status symbol. Um, on the right, this is a harder quiz. Anyone know this person? You'd have to be a sinologist if they still live. You know. Someone is studying the East. This is Shigatoshi Yoshinara. He is a banker, but was a samurai. Okay? This is a little easier for American financial or just general historians. Supreme Court experts might also know this individual. Civil War buffs. Salmon Chase. So he was the Treasury Secretary under Abraham Lincoln and also became a Supreme Court justice. And on the right, we have what most of you could probably figure out just by the architecture, a bank. But it is the first, the very first national bank chartered in the US. So somehow I'm going to connect all four of these pictures. That's the, 
the um, items you can keep in mind. So I want to, just to fix ideas and start super uh, simply, not to insult any of you who know a lot more about this than I do in the audience, I want to just start by thinking about finance. And I'm just going to give you a simple way, I think a, a very intuitive way to, to think about finance today. And that is to say, it's a really cool technology. We can't move people through time, but we can move value and wealth through time. And that's what finance does. It can pull, pull value forward and backwards. And the more financial innovation we have, the more efficiently we can do that. And so some of this is just so obvious to us, we forget how amazing it really is. So take a mortgage, take a standard mortgage issued in this country like a 30-year mortgage. What are we doing? Well, we're, we're all of a sudden endowing someone with um, an enormous fortune that, they're gonna, that they can use to buy an asset, uh, a, a property. And we can do that because we can basically borrow against future income. We can find a creditor out there that's willing to lend, who is willing to basically um, get future money for a cheap price, and in turn allow someone to have a veritable fortune at their disposal to buy a house in a place like Boulder, especially, right? And so these are such simple, simple technologies that we forget how really revolutionary they are. But they're very old. They've been around um, you know, since, since BCE. Um, not all of them, not all the ones we're talking about, but many of them have. Many of them date back to, you know, to classical history. And, um, but they're super powerful, and they can reconfigure human relationships. They can be used as a means for, uh, for fighting wars. They can be a means for, um, for um, achieving peace. Um, I'm probably going to be focusing a little more on the latter um, way of reconfiguring human relationships today. I want to show how we could build coalitions to stop a civil war in particular. But, these, but finance is very, it's very powerful. And, um, and it's certainly, we know um, that it can redistribute risk among agents. And here agents, I'm just being using econ speak. You know, we're just thinking about households or firms or these sorts of things. Now, like any technology, it's not intrinsically good or bad. Um, it's neutral. But of course, it always has connotations attached to it, as Taylor alluded to. Um, and these, some of these, um, there's always been a kind of a moral component of it. We could go back to Aristotle, and go back to politics, and we could read the most hated sort of money making and what the greatest reason is usury, which makes a gain out of money itself, and not from the natural use of it. For money was intended to be used in exchange, but not to increase at interest. So the, so the, um, the prohibitions on that the hatred of compound interest and the prohibitions on usury, they, they go back uh, a long time. And so there's always been this kind of belief that there's a, a good and a bad or a yin and a yang to finance. And yet, if we go back to these same periods of time when these prohibitions came about, we actually discover from, from classicists that many of the modern um, pieces of finance that we have with us today date to those periods. That nevertheless, despite those prohibitions, it was encouraged. So banking, coinage, commercial courts, those are all attributable to the Athenians. The Romans added business corporations, limited liability investments, and a, and a type of central banking. These are very old ideas. Um, classical Western thought gave us many of these ideas. And so we know that um, often when there are crises or bubbles, um, culture has a backlash against finance, um, that we see that still playing out today around us, right? That culture responds to all kinds of crises um, in, in ways that um, we often give it negative connotations, things that I call the, you know, from Dickens, the season of darkness. And, um, and some scholars would say these are perhaps cofactors, I don't want to say causal, but maybe cofactors in imperialism or income inequality. I've spent a lot of my, my own personal research looking at these pathological cases, studying crises. I, I quite like studying crises as an economic historian. They're fascinating to me. But today I want to talk about the seasons of light. Um, I want to talk about how economists have suggested that finance can be very important to the development of cities, to the development of um, nation states and to the development of trade. 
Uh, I want to talk about less about other aspects that are also part of the seasons of light, how 20th century finance um, really democratized um, investing. Um, and I also want to talk today about how I think it can have a role in reshaping political coalitions so that if we know there are things we could do to improve, say, um, living standards or to allow an economy to get out of a, a, a low level equilibrium trap where it's not growing, that we might be able to build coalitions in support of that um, through um, financial innovation. And so this is, uh, this is more about what my talk's about today. Now there's a long literature on what's called finance-led development. And again, many of you in this room know that literature quite well, and I'm not doing justice to it here. I'm just trying to suggest to you that the early studies certainly were focused on um, looking across countries. So maybe among economic historians, you would take Western European countries and a few of the offshoots, so Canada and the US and Norway and Sweden, maybe. England and you'd have some homogeneity and you would look and see, you know, is there a, some kind of correlation between a broad proxy for finance, maybe the ratio of money to, to GDP or the ratio of credit to GDP, and see if, see if that's correlated with an outcome variable uh, and observe uh, something like uh, income per capita. And so there, you know, the studies became more sophisticated, and some of them suggest nonlinearities, that it's particularly important in the early phase of growth, so that if you can get the financial institutions early on, that that will have a compounding effect, if you will. Um, and so that was what the literature kind of started out exploring. It was kind of the state of the art of the, of the econometrics from uh, the statistical methods from 20, 30 years ago. And you know, like any field, e economics evolves, and so with greater skepticism, we wanted to improve upon that and see if we could actually kind of have a causal argument. You know, could we actually say that, could we find cases where somehow through some kind of shock, we could order things and say that maybe finance, we could find a case where finance actually was kind of put in place or financial institutions were put in place and we can use that random variation to see that it actually is a driver of growth rather than the other way around so, so that we don't have to solve the chicken and egg problem. So because we all know that economic activity is gonna create a demand for financial services and so it's hard to know which, which precedes which. So this is gonna be the approach today. You're gonna to say, well, why, why one country? And I'm gonna give you several reasons. I'm gonna say, you know, there is a literature out there exploring in a cross-country framework, and I'm gonna be focusing on a particular case study. And that case study is interesting because it's, a, it's kind of a quasi-natural experimental setting. And it allows us to see some things both about coalition building as well as about this, this story about finance leading development. So as Taylor mentioned, Japan was really the first non-European offshoot to modernize its economy and get on to what you know, uh, kind of economic historians say is you know, sustained path to economic development, where year after year you're having positive rates of growth and you've escaped that Malthusian trap. So it's a question. I mean, we, for those of you who are interested in economic history and you think about things like the Great Divergence, you know, why did the Industrial Revolution happen in Western Europe and not in um, advanced uh, societies such as China. Um, this is another puzzle. Why Japan, right? I don't know. I mean, that's worth, that's a, it's a question out there worth exploring. I have some ideas today I'm gonna share why I think it was important, but it's a, it's a big question out there. And so, um, so the, the approach I'm gonna take draws on another large literature in economics, which has emphasized the importance of institutions. And um, so those of you, who are familiar, familiar with Duran Asemoglu's work and Simon Johnson and Jim Robinson's work. You know, there's a large literature exploring the relationship between institutions um, developed in the past and how those continue to exert an influence on outcomes today. And so that's a bit of a deterministic view of history, but I don't think they really mean it that way. I think they think of these things as, as fundamentals that then determine things like um, investments in human capital and physical capital. So what, what it appears to be the case is that Japan was particularly adept at putting in place growth enhancing institutions, that it was good at this. And so how did it succeed where other nations failed? It did a lot of interesting things. A lot of things that we saw um, were um, actually 
quite old financial technologies. So it developed uh, a financial system in the late 19th century, 19th century that eventually included commercial banks that had a sound money based on uh, a numeraire like gold so that they could tie down prices. So that allowed them to have also have stable public finances. They uh, put in place a central bank and they created securities markets. Um, interestingly enough, some of the first futures markets were developed in Japan around, the, uh, around rice markets, but they didn't have, for example, um, pre-1870, they had no bond market. So this is like a lot of developing economies. There was no place for, that, for, for um, the businesses to um, uh, float debt in order to grow. Um, so how did they do this? Again, as Taylor mentioned, they sent missions abroad and they were, um, they were the, the, Earth, the Meiji period that I'm gonna be talking about um, was run by technocrats. And these technocrats were um, very open-minded about trying to figure out how other nations did things. And so they went to where growth had already taken place, which was primarily Europe and Western Europe and its offshoots, and they studied the institutions. And so they brought back educational systems and dairying systems and central banks from all different parts of the world, most of which were coming from, uh, again, Western Europe and North America. So I spent a year at the Central Bank of Japan as a visiting researcher, and if you visit the old building, it is literally a replica of the Banque de Belgique, the Central Bank of Belgium. And you can find, I think, a Belgian central banker can find his or her office in the Bank of Japan. It's, it's like a replica. Um, it's amazing. Or, uh, you know, the first time I went to Japan, I was a little worried that I wouldn't be able to have yogurt or dairy. And turns out I was completely wrong because Hokkaido has a dairying industry that's 100 years old because they sent a mission to, to, to study dairying and they brought cows back from New Jersey. So Hokkaido has lots of dairy cows and you can get wonderful milk products in Japan. So they, they did this and they did it, you know, in a pretty systematic fashion. And so it's a really about kind of an interesting story about institutional learning. But the, the, there's still a puzzle that remains, which is to say a young emperor assumes the throne in a very turbulent time. The emperor was, this is called the Meiji Restoration for a, a, a reason, it's restoring the royal family to the head of the government. And so I'll talk a lot about the historical background of this, but until this point in time, the emperor was a figurehead, kind of um, secluded and um, cloistered in, in Kyoto and in, in the ancient city, and really had no authority. So it was a government that was run by a military leader. In modern terms, it would be a generalissimo, what we would call then a shogun. Um, and so um, how did young Emperor Meiji build a coalition that could not only overthrow the shogun regime, but then successfully implement all this reform I just talked about. And so what I'm gonna ask today, today is, you know, more broadly, do, does this case study, and less so today because I'm not gonna present the formal model, does theory have, have any ability to tell us something about how to build these successful uh, coalitions? And, and, and more specifically, um, can we finance that there are innovations in finance or technologies and finance that we can use to build these coalitions um, for reform. And if so, um, did this whole process then contribute to the development of Japan? So that's the, that's the broad brush kind of where I'm going. Now I'm gonna start uh, with kind of the big political economy question. So here, just step back from Meiji Japan for a minute and just ask yourself, how does a reforming leader assume power in a country and, and put in place reforms? How would you do that? Well, the, the common story is that we know of is something like this, that if we look around the world, there's, um, there's persistent underdevelopment. So there are many countries we know of today that are stuck with so-called bad institutions, institutions that don't seem to allow them to get on this escalator of growth where they can have year after year sustained growth. They might achieve it for a decade, or a half decade, and then they'll have negative growth and take that away. And so the common person never sees that prosperity. Um, this is, uh, this is young, a young emperor, um, Guangzhou. Uh, he is uh, 17 when he assumes the throne, and he decides to try to modernize China. 
by modernization here, I mean eliminate offices that really have no productive capacity. They just pay people, so eliminate sinecure. Build a modern educational system. Uh, move from uh, an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. Um, develop, uh, put in place a uh, modern educational institution like the, um, the Peking University. Build a railroad. Uh, rapidly industrialize. Strengthen the military to repel foreigners. If you were to look at the list of things that Emperor Meiji does, it's all those. So this comes after that. If you look at the timing, this is 1898. I'm going to be talking about reforms in the late 1860s and 1870s. But as most of us know, maybe this is called 100-day reform for a reason. So it's not a story written about in your standard development economics text. Why? Because it ends like most countries. It ends with this menacing figure on the right, Dowager Sichi, and um, Prince Duan staging a coup d'etat over the young reformist-minded prince and his technocrats and imprisoning him in the Forbidden City until 1908 and hanging all the technocratic reformers to make an example of them. So we know China's growth process didn't start till much later. And this is the standard outcome. This is, this is the, his, the, the standard story of um, underdevelopment, right? That you have reformist-minded re, reformist young leader, can't build a coalition, someone has a lot to lose, and so they're gonna block that reform. And this one ends violently, they don't have to end violently, but they often do. And so the potential losers mobilize and block that reform. Now what's going on here? Well, from a finance, from a very kind of um, e economist or finance perspective, we have agents with different endowments. And here I want you to think about endowments really broadly. It could be land, it could be financial resources, it could be um, your educational level, it could also be your caste or ethnicity. Um, and all these are differences in endowments and they're within a society. And so how do you get people to go along with reforms? Um, if you have incomplete markets and you allow a set of um, agents in your economy to make decisions, so you have a set of George Bushian deciders or decision makers, though it turns out that you can write down a model and show that, um, that under any kind of political setup with incomplete markets, it turns out you're going to only vote for the reform if it's going to preserve the value of your endowments or decrease the variance. Okay, so this is kind of borrowing from finance to kind of put it in finance terms. Now what's really interesting is that if you then allow complete markets and, make, and allow people to trade their endowments, if you will, that's what we're kind of talking about by complete markets, you might be able to do something different and you might be able to get um, these misaligned incentives to be aligned. And so the typical approach to this, just to give you a contrast to what I'm studying, is to say, well, um, if you homogenize endowments, that would mean partitioning, right? So let's take, a, let's take the Hutus and Tutsis and let's divide them up, and there, that solves it. Well, not so fast. Economists really don't find evidence for that partitioning to work. Another potential solution is to do redistribution to middle class. It turns out that the evidence on that's super weak as well. So you can take a homo homogenous society, you can redistribute to the middle class, and still you get the reforms blocked. So, so this is an intractable problem in political economy. How do you build these coalitions? And that's the, that's the challenge. And, and what we're going to argue is that these Meiji technocratic reformers thought of clever ways to um, kind of novel solutions on how to organize and share future opportunities. And that they're gonna be based, and this is the key insight that we have, on contingent claims. A contingent claim is a claim that pays off in certain states of the world in the future. And so the particular contingent claim that is going to be used in this case are going to be government bonds. Why government bonds? Well, I'll go into it more detail why government bonds, but for those of you who are economists, it's like, well, that's great, because those are the most liquid asset in the world. You just can you know, turn on the printing presses, more or less, print those up and distribute those out. But it turns out um, that um, there 
they're great contingent claims because if the Meiji government doesn't succeed, the value of these claims would go to zero. So the, the opponents to a reform are gonna have an incentive to see the regime succeed because those bonds will pay off. And so that's the key insight that I'm gonna be talking about today. And what's really interesting is you may be saying to yourself, I don't believe that theoretical story at all. There are always groups that are gonna stand in the way and block this and markets are never like an economist describes, they're never complete and these sorts of things. And we're gonna show that in a world in which there was a single decision maker, the Shogun, um, and where there was a well-defined caste or ethnicity that was going to lose a lot, um, that we can still get these outcomes. So in our estimation, this is work uh, with co-authors, in our estimation, this is a hopeful solution, a way to move forward in, in these um, broader questions about how to build coalitions. Now there's a second part of this that's really interesting and it's gonna be really important for two reasons. One is that uh, we need to convince the losers in the case of, of, of 19th century Japan that they're gonna be okay. And it turns out the bonds themselves may not have been sufficient on that margin. So it's gonna be important for that, but it's also really important for this secondary question that I brought up at the start, which is to say, are there any good cases of finance-led development? And it turns out that the technocrats in their missions around uh, scouring the world chose a very peculiar financial institution on which to build on. And this means they were, they were clever and smart because they didn't have to choose. No one would say the US national banking system was necessarily optimal in all margins, right? Some people might in this room might even say, you know, the period of free banking before it was better than introducing national banks. But what was interesting about national banks is that of course, they were introduced in the US in part for financing the Civil War. The North needed, the North needed funds um, and it couldn't rely on tax revenue, so it issues debt. And it allows that debt to be used to start US national banks. And the Japanese technocrats see this and they say, oh, that's kind of interesting. What if we allow these bonds, so-called samurai bonds or commutation bonds to be used to start banks in Japan? And so Japan goes from effectively an unbanked economy, there are money lenders, to having over 170 banks in a three year period. And I'm gonna show you some evidence that suggests that those places that got the banks um, experienced better local economic development. And so that's the finance and development side of, of the story. Okay, so um, again, I'm not gonna, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna show you the model today, but there we have a little model that uh, illustrates how complete financial securitization in principle could solve this more general political economy problem. What I'm gonna spend a lot more time talking about is the historical case study, and then show you uh, really some visual, Im primarily visual images on this, these novel data we've been collecting for the last seven years. So most of the documents, um, are in, written in old Japanese. Um, and um, fortunately, I have a co-author, Masanori Takashima, who is one of the few people in the world who, um, who reads old Japanese. It doesn't resemble modern Japanese and it doesn't re resemble Chinese if you think, oh, well, you know, kanji's based on Chinese. Nope, it's its own little thing. And so fortunately, he happened to be the archivist when I was visiting the Central Bank of Japan and I met him. And so, uh, so, uh, that cross-pollinization led me to ask him to help on this project, and he's been indispensable in terms of helping us um, track data over time. Now, this, is, this sounds like, you'll see the data, and you'll oh, these are pretty pictures, but here's what we're having to do. We're having to match, um, the boundaries don't stay the same. And so if you're a, an empirically oriented economist and you wanna study civil war periods, it's tricky stuff because you need to fix boundaries at some point in time. So we're gonna fix boundaries based on the feudal period, the shogunate period, and then we're gonna show you outcomes based on before and after. And that's tricky, right? Because they stopped collecting data on the after. So, so much, a lot of the archival research is trying to find data series where we can map it into these, these old boundaries after the old boundaries have been obliterated by the new regime. And so that's the, that's the empirical challenge and why you say, good earth, you know, why, would, you know, why would it take anyone five years to assemble empirical data? So, um, 
So what happens, and this is hard to show, I can just state it, violence ceases after these reforms. I'll talk about the violence, but showing you the violence ceases, I'm showing you a null set, I'm showing you nothing, so there's no more violence. It ceases, the Civil War ends, the 10 year Civil War, the reforms are sustained. On average, banks set up in places where these samurai bonds are distributed or concentrated, um, um, they, they do better off. They experience faster population growth. And this is surprising because all, all else equal, these places really ought to wither, and I'll, I'll provide some reasons why that's the case. And it's interesting from this finance and development story because the financial revolution really precedes the economic growth of Japan. So the growth that I was talking about before and that Taylor alluded to comes after 1870. It's like really after these banks get put in place. And so harder to tell a macro story, like how much of this contributed to overall general economic growth, but we can find evidence at the local level. And um, so that's kind of the picture. So here's one of these pretty maps. This is measuring things down at a unit that you can think of almost like a county. It's called a GUN, and G-U-N. And um, this is showing you kind of uh, the um, political fractionalization of Japan prior to Emperor Meiji. It goes from one of the most fractionalized um, political entities in the world to a nation state in a matter of a decade, which is really impressive. Um, many historians have commented on this. Until that point in time, Japan, Japan can best be described as very fluid. It's a, it's a coalition sort of um, military government where a principal figure, a um, daimyo, a lord, is able to build a large enough co coalition to become the shogun, which is again like a, a generalissimo, who, um, who basically has to keep the other uh, daimyo lords in check uh, in order to maintain power. So there are more, there are around 300 of these individuals. And, um, and so you can think of this as not a static system at all, but very dynamic. And you're constant, your, your authority is being constantly challenged. So even though we often say, oh, military dictators ruled Japan, for those of you who like film and cinema, of course you know that there's been lots of shoguns that are overthrown and new coalitions get built. And over the sweep of 700 years, you have different um, families of, shoguns ruling Japan. And they would do all sorts of clever things, like those of you interested in like mechanism design, you know, they, would, they would hold the um, other daimyo's loved ones um, in modern day Tokyo um, hostage for a year and keep them there in case they, they tried to rebel. And if they rebelled, well, they would just you know, kill the loved ones, this sort of stuff. So they had these all kinds of mechanisms to try to keep order. But the, the tent government, bakufu means tent, that was, uh, that was always a system that required support from lots of coalitions. And what happens in 1866 is there's an increasing concern about, um, about foreigners arriving um, in Japan. And Japan had been a relatively closed economy, um, not open to trade. Um, foreigners were not allowed to walk the streets. And then Admiral Perry shows up in the early 1860s. He's a US admiral with so-called black ships and forcibly opens Yokohama to trade. And this is a signal, more or less, that the old world order is being threatened by outside forces. And the question is, was the, was the shogun regime going to be strong enough to repel the foreigners? And there's great concern because they see the modern weaponry of, a, of the um, US naval fleet, and they are instantly threatened by this. So uh, a coalition forms known as the Satsuma Chosu uh, Coalition, and they lead they lead the overthrow of the Tokugawa shogunate. And they put the, the restoration, this term Meiji restoration means they elevate the emperor to the throne. And so that the emperor now becomes uh, the leader, not just a figurehead, but the leader of the country. And, and the, the claim to the throne happens to be young, this young emperor who becomes Emperor Meiji. So he's not experienced, he doesn't have a background in administration and he's gonna have to rely on um, uh, um, uh, others to help him um, sustain this economy. Now, um, me, um, Meiji, um, Meiji Ishi means like enlightened rule. And the notion was um, to combine Eastern values with Western ideas. And so, um, so he assembles a team of technocrats and they instantly go about changing the political 
and economic system of Japan. And this is done with uh, kind of uh, royal decrees and edicts. So hundreds of these are issued. Um, initially, they're having a hard time even defeating the shogun. So there's a, a, a war that continues really forces loyal to the shogunate. They, um, they resist rule. Uh, there's a breakaway republic um, in northern Japan that they have to put down. They really don't gain control until 1869. Um, in terms of gaining control, that means that the daimyo, the other daimyo, are willing to, um, uh, to go along with the fact the shogun has been defeated. And so in... Um, in 1871, the emperor summons all those lords. They're the ones that make up all those colored regions and forces them to, to basically ends feudalism, make, makes them forfeit all their feudal domains. And so the lords have, think of this as each one of, each daimyo had its own standing army. And those were the shogun. I mean, the, I mean sorry, those were the samurai. And the samurai were also increasingly administrators. So, you know, there hadn't been a lot of war recently, and so they kind of were getting a stipend, living off their lord, um, collecting taxes from the peasants. Peasants couldn't leave where they were. There are checkpoints at every location along these roads, and so it's really much like um, feudal Europe, right? You have a local leader with their army um, and a force loyal to that local leader. So this regime comes um, comes to a dramatic end with a series of decrees, and um, among which are a new form of administration. So they set up, um, it's actually kind of two, two stages, but they set up uh, provinces, or you can think of them as the modern prefectures, and they're gonna be ruled by court-appointed administrators, no longer by the daimyo. So the daimyo uh, are basically um, given one-tenth of their domain's income, and then they're made a noble class. So there's a new class created um, called Kazoku, and so they're not gonna lose their status, um, and they're given compensation. Now, it turns out, and I'm not gonna focus on this today because it's a part of our ongoing research, they're also given access to one of these financial institutions. I'll talk a little more about that, but that, that's probably important as well. I just don't have all the evidence on that yet. The point here is that feudalism is abolished, and it's a decisive commitment to change. So now there's labor mobility. If you're a, if you're a peasant, you no longer have to stay on the domain of the, of the daimyo. You can, um, you can go to Osaka or Tokyo. Um, so why stay down on the farm when you can go to Tokyo or Osaka? And so you might do that. Um, and, um, and so over a course of a period of, uh, of a decade, um, as Marius Jansen, the famous historian, says in Japan, which became the Meiji um, period, is, came, became started as one of the world's most fractured economy uh, polities, then became one of its most centralized states. Now, clearly, not everyone was going to win from this. And again, so those of you who are fans of cinema, this case even Western cinema, um, might recognize a few of these pictures coming up from a, a movie. So this should have a movie credit there. Samurai are really a caste, so they're, they, they marry within themselves, so they're endogamous. And talking to my other co-author who's Indian, I take his word that that's how we, should, we can and should define a caste. So um, they are hereditary uh, warrior administrators, and I'm gonna show you why I think they were the biggest potential losers and why they had every incentive in the world to block the, the Meiji reforms. So first of all, there are about 400,000 samurai, 400, samurai households and 1.9 million um, people um, under um, samurai uh, jurisdiction, so families and dependents and these sorts of things. So to put that in perspective, if you think about the French Revolution, it's about 10 times the size of the losing class in the French Revolution. This is big. It's about 6% of the population at the time. And there's a samurai right there, um, famous samurai, as you all know. Um, so what, why are they so angry? Why do they look like Tom Cruise? Um, so, Tom, so they are angry because they're losing three things. They're going to lose their stipends, which were paid out by their lords. Why are they losing that? Because feudalism's come to an end. Um, the government immediately cuts those by a third in 1869. And then in 1873, it tries coercing the samurai to relinquish them by taxing those who refuse 
They're going to lose their position in society. So remember, they wear two swords. They're no longer uh, allowed to walk about town in swords. So they start adopting modern dress. And then they, you would strip them here of their swords. Um, and then they're outright, one of the edicts just takes the lowest class of the samurai. And there's a huge variation in um, their, the, the stipends. They can go anywhere from you know, kind of 5 yen to 5,000 yen um, in terms of the um, the amount they were paid on an annual uh, on a retainer, and so the the edict in December 1872 denies them their status. So denies the sotsu, the lowest class samurai, their status. And then they create a conscripted modern military, and that's where this last samurai movie comes in, right? So this is you'll see if you watch that movie, you'll see a modern conscripted army that's going to go battle the last remaining. Um, um, forces that are loyal to the old traditional ways. And so they create this conscripted army, which means that they're losing their monopoly over violence. So this is uh, 10, 10 minutes. OK, so this is, this is what happened. And so in response to all of this, let me just say there were, the Civil War then continues. So they defeat the initial um, shogunate regime, but then uh, rebellions break out in many places. So. I say I, 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 this is important because it wasn't like the technocrats got it right from the beginning. They did a lot of things that angered the samurai. And then they searched for s further solutions. So the, the Satsuma Rebellion is what the, um, the Last Samurai is based on. And this was um, basically, you can think of this as a paramilitary organization that formed its own state in southern Japan and was holding out for the old ways. They decided that the emperor was too reformist. and actually aimed to eliminate them, which was true. The emperor wanted to defeudalize society. And they didn't want to give up their way of life. And so that, that the scenes from that movie are really about this famous historical battle between the forces lo loyal to um, this person named Saigo um, and um, the modern military coming in and quashing that. OK, so the. Meiji government recognized there was a problem, that their initial reforms were um, destroying the livelihood of samurai. And so this is like the Alexander Hamilton of, of, um, of Japan. His name is Matsukata Masayoshi. And um, he has a nice book translated in English. And you can read a lot of this um, in his memoirs. But uh, um, the point is that this quote basically says, if we had remained an onlooker, we realize we wouldn't have been able to sustain our, our agenda. So that's the, so ignoring the samurai problem is the difference between peace and rebellion. So what did they do? They created a compulsory compensation scheme. And it's a large scheme because this is a huge burden on the finances of Japan. Um, this amount, the, the stipends that they had been paying out were about 40% of national income. And so what they're going to do is they're going to issue bonds. And the holders of the bonds, this is kind of an interesting bond. They're a commutation bond. The creditors instantly become the samurai. So unlike a typical bond uh, where a government would issue the bond and there might be a widespread ownership of the bonds, in this case, you can think of this as converting samurai stipends into um, bonds. So they're going to take, um, they have a scheme based on the rank of the samurai and, um, um, and how much their stipends were worth. And they convert that into a fixed number of bonds, paying different amounts of different coupons, different amounts of interest based on the rank of the samurai. And it's inversely proportional. So in other words, richer samurais get a capitalized value of their incomes that's shorter, just five years for the richest, um, and a lower interest rate, a 5% bond. And they'll get those payments over a 30-year horizon. So that ends up being about a quarter of their previous income. And a poor samurai uh, will get, uh, on say, a 100 yen retainer, will get about 2 thirds of their previous income from, these, from the interest on the bonds payable. But again, the, the interest is only going to be payable if, if the Meiji government stays in power. OK, so, um, so what they've done is they've taken a, a non-liquid, non-tradable asset the stipend that was trade to their identity, their um, caste or ethnicity, and that was denominated in rice payments and converted it to a financial instrument, a government bond, which is you know, the deepest and most liquid asset of all bonds. 
Interestingly enough, they have to create a, a capital market to do this in. They didn't have a domestic bond market, so in the background, they also have to ramp that whole part of the finance up. So um, what's the second thing they do? Well, the cost of that war is highly inflationary. To put down the Satsuma Rebellion, the government is spending a lot of money. And for those of you who hold bonds know, you don't like inflation if you're a creditor. And so those bonds are going to be losing value, and so why should you go along with this reform if the value of the bonds will buy you fewer and fewer goods? So they implement a second reform, and this is where they go and scour the Western countries for institutions, and they settle on the banking system developed by the US during its civil war, the US national banking system. And it has this one really interesting provision, which is that government bonds could be used as equity to start new banks. And so um, if you look at the national banking acts of Japan, they're modeled identically to the national banking acts of, uh, of the US. And the provision that matters here is that they could, the banks could have 80% of their equity in the form of bonds. So what does that allow the samurai to do? It allows them to become stakeholders um, in um, financial development of the country, as well as to protect their uh, capital or their assets from, from inf um, inflation risk. So these, bank, these banks have many of the features of uh, modern Western banks. You know, they're limited liability organizations. They're organized as joint stock companies. That's going to encourage risk taking. And so if we're thinking about the mechanisms through which this would influence local economic development, it's really going to be about leveraging more than about um, pooling a mass of savings. Because there's no mass of savings to be pooled here. It's more that the fractional reserve banks actually create credit. And that credit can be used to invest in new kinds of businesses. And so that's the mechanism through which it, would, um, it could affect uh, economic development. OK, and so again, is, do you believe that they actually knew what they were doing? I mean, it's a, it's a fair issue. All we can do is go to the documentary evidence and act like a historian and kind of try to read this. And again, this is from Matsukata. And they saw that previous kind of types of reforms, some of those early ones where they just said, you be a farmer, that wasn't working out well at all. The, the samurai were really unhappy and they're continuing to rebel. And so they came up with this other scheme of letting them be bank stockholders. And so as a result of this, we get this massive increase um, in banks. So there are a few trading banks that exist prior to this. They, they do a first national banking act, which they get all wrong, they make the notes convertible into gold. And so those of you know who know Gresham's Law, you know the good money is driven out by the bad money, and everyone takes the bank notes and gets the gold, and the, the, they realize they did the reform wrong. So the second banking act is really where then the samurai um, take their bonds and invest in them. And, you, and then you're saying to yourself, well, how do I know that, oh, and here's just the geographical dispersion of the um, national banks that get established. So it's all throughout the country, right? These are the 150 banks. Um, I'll show you more pictures like this. So you're like, how do you know that it was samurai that held this? Well, the bonds weren't distributed equally. Remember, the bonds are kind of predetermined. The drops are predetermined based on your pre meiji status, your, your status from the previous regime, from the feudal regime. And when we look at data, we only have a few data points here. We have 1878 and we have 1882. The ownership of the stock is largely in the hands of the samurai, and I should add the, the daimyo for this one bank that they have access to. And after the second reform, the violence stops. And what do the samurais do? They get involved in political reform. They become um, uh, leaders in the debtors' parties and in the popular rights movements. So our our Academic paper is called, um, um, you know, from it's called Swords into Bank Shares. And an outcome that we're exploring is how then they get involved in the popular rights movements, these er nascent early political movements. So, what I'm going to just kind of uh, wrap up with how many minutes do I have? Two? Yeah. So, what I'm going to wrap up with is just some pictorial evidence on why I think this, these mechanisms are actually at work. So, first, uh, we want to see that. You know, banks get created where bonds were given to the samurai. So this chart shows you the stipends per recipient, and then we can lay the bank starts over them, and the darker areas are where there are more recipients, and then if you ran a regression, you'd see a relationship there. 
What's of particular interest is the castle towns because samurai had to live on the walls of the castle town. So we even have better identification. We know exactly where the bonds essentially were dropped. And so all else equal, uh, we might expect these castle towns to decline because they no longer have an importance. You know, the old administrative regime is taken away and as I told you, it's all reorganized in a different way. And so we have this kind of heterogeneous treatment going on where we're dropping bonds based on predetermined characteristics and there's no reason why these castle towns are necessarily better places now that you no longer have a feudal regime. So now we have little pictures of the castles and what we're showing you here is that there's a, a, a relationship between castle towns, stipends, and bank formation. And so, you know, you might say, but the castle towns might have been better off. Well, not really. They lacked the initial conditions. And when we control for those initial conditions in a regression, it turns out those initial conditions aren't driving it. And so the last little piece of evidence I want to show you is that in places where um, there were banks set up in castle towns, they grew faster than either places that just uh, were castle towns or had the pre-reform banks. Um, in other words, it's the interaction between the, the banks and the bonds and the samurai residing in those places that is driving um, the population growth. So there's a few other things I, we can talk about in the Q&A, but you know, in a sense, my story is motivated by a classic kind of macro picture like this. We have a lot of underdevelopment that still exists in the world, um, and we're those of you who think that institutions rule to some extent that they're of primary importance, how do we get out of that bad institution trap? Well, you have to build coalitions to support reform and to escape that straitjacket that we often see in political economy. I'm offering up a solution of contingent claims, in this case, government bonds that were distributed to the losers um, of the reforms, and then they had a stake in that government and could support those reforms because the valuation of their bonds and the valuation of their banks would benefit from success in the Meiji regime. And that, that's what, in a sense, allows them to adopt all those other Western institutions that we alluded to and that Taylor alluded to in, in the introduction. So I'll leave it there since I'm out of time. Thank you. And just a final word, I hope you know how these are all connected now. You know, the, the pictures. All right, so I think we take a few questions. Yeah. Oh, don't, let's, let's do oh yeah, so there's a, for the uh, camera. Thank you for the talk. So I had two questions. Uh, I more or less believe the later part of the explanation about the samurai getting compensated, but I want to talk about the earlier part. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's two questions. So first, you made a comparison with the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And what I think is interesting there, and you didn't really touch upon, is that in both cases, the elites are pretty divided about the future reforms. So they don't homogeneously resist in either case. In fact, there's a fair amount of pro 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 prominent French revolutionaries who are either minor nobles or even slightly major nobles. So it's not like en bloc, they all resist. And so the question I want to know is, well, what drove? Do we know? How much do we know about samurais making the decision of how they feel about this future plan, given it's not like it was, a, so far as I can tell, a 90-10 ratio, where it's basically they all or almost all resisted. The mm -hmm. Meiji had samurai on their side. Um, and when you look at the numbers, for example, the rebellion, uh, 30,000 samurai is not that much. Uh, you have 16th uh, century battles with 70,000 men on one side. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not exactly like um, all the samurai rebelled. And perhaps prior to that, the second question is really about how much external factors are weighing on it. So the samurai regime is a military one, which depends upon the ability of the authorities to ensure security. And the samurai were obviously ruled that. Now, when you get humiliated by a foreign power, it seems like it opens up a window of opportunity because this mm -hmm. external event, which you can't bring about by yourself, mm -hmm. um, creates a window of opportunity. It's like, well, wait a second, maybe the order we have isn't so good. So if you try to run the story without foreigners showing up and humiliating you, mm -hmm. uh, what are the odds of starting this? Because if the goal is to say, when you're in a bad situation, through institutions, you can improve things, well, if the full story says, well, maybe actually getting the institution going 
might require these external factors we can't really bring about on our own precisely because they are, by definition, external, they escape our control. So what's the, the story there about a window oper opening up because of factors that escape your control? Mm -hmm. Those are both great questions. Um, so your first question is, again, trying to think through um, you know, to what extent are the um, samurai really heterogeneous or homogeneous in their beliefs? And um, I would say that the um, one notable difference between the French Revolution and the period I'm talking about in Japan is that the, the, um, the, sam the samurai are loyal to a lord. They are vassals of that, and their whole livelihood and status depends on that lord. And so when the lords give up, that angers them because they know they're going to lose their status in society, and they're not compensated as the lords are with a, a new social class. Rather, they're stripped of all of that. And so it's a great question to say, well, how loyal would you then be? And it ties into the second question which you're raising, which is initially, um, the, um, the Meiji reformers get support from powerful coalitions in the south of in Kyushu um, because they're scared of this external threat. And they don't think the shogunate regime is responding appropriately to it. Why that one battle is highlighted here is because the very people who then had supported Emperor Meiji early on flip. And so it's a really interesting case because the ones that were most supporting the new regime actually become the agents of holdout. And so, it's, it's so we actually get reversal. And they are, um, they are just the preservers of the tradition. And to minimize what they had done is really not to understand how much of southern uh, the main island of Japan, the southern part, they had ca carved out under their own control. I mean, this is uh, really a civil war that's going on for 10 years. I highlighted one battle, but there are many rebellions taking place throughout. It's a great question to ask, you know, what's the tipping point, and to what extent did that external shock really kind of set this whole process underway? It, you may be right. It may be that, that you need that shock um, that external shock to realign, um, to, to initially create a window of opportunity. But what's interesting in the Japanese case is it creates a window of opportunity for the emperor to, re, re, to assume the throne, but then those people who help him assume it then are, become the holdouts. And so they were initially the supporters, but then they, they believe that the emperor is going too far. And they don't support, they didn't know that supporting the emperor meant the destruction of their way of life. And so I want to minimize the, the, um, those forces in the South, ba both based on the, 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 um, the share of the fraction of land that they held, but also the importance they held in kind of establishing the early um, stability of the Meiji regime. And so when they leave the administration, it's a huge blow to the um, belief um, that the, um, that, that uh, Meiji coalition will stay in power. And so it really is a civil war that's going on for 10 years. It just so happens that's the last battle. And you could also ask a third question, which is in the same spirit of yours, which is to say, well, how much of it was really that last battle? And once that last holdout is defeated, that's really what's driving it all, and it's not your reforms, right? Um, it's a good question, and it was one that I didn't uh, you know, have time to get at. But you could think of it like an economist and say, um, you know, they could have taken the money and bought more weapons. That's what happens in many countries. Like you, you compensate losers. So often people say, well, all you're doing is compensating losers. And actually, no, we're doing a lot more than that. We're giving them contingent claims. Because compensating losers just means, great, we get to go buy more weapons. And then we're going to weaponize and you know, keep, the, keep the fight going. Our story's subtler. And, and so you know, I tried to, as best I could, I got the returns of these banks. And you can try to be like a, f a modern finance person. And you know, I'm not controlling for risk here. I mean, clearly, we know that the investments are 
riskier that a bank's undertaking than uh, you know, a government bond, but then the government bond we know is maybe not sustainable. So these are the kind of rates of return, and the, the rates of return are pretty good. You know, most of us would be happy with a 14.5% return on our, on our portfolio if we had one asset of, you know, one financial asset. And that's the average um, paying dividend in 1879. Um, the, then, so if you notice that um, picture of the banks, you saw that the banks capped out and there were no new bank starts. That's because they had a total limit in note issuance. These are note issuing banks. So once they hit that threshold, no new banks could be created. So then they created subsequent banking acts. And even with new competition from these things called quasi-banks and private banks, those national banks are still, with competition, earning a, a return of 14%. So I think there were financial incentives that kept them from picking up their arms, which I know wasn't your question, um, but is kind of a related question about, well, they could have really continued in that path of, of um, holding out. And, and I think that they, they may have realized that was the last meaningful battle. If you were a Hollywood person, that's the way you would portray it. And I'm going to give you a little more nuanced story to say, well, they had a financial interest to put down those swords as well. Um, but these are great points. And I think they're hard to really you know, prove one way or the other, but, but, but excellent points. Mm -hmm. Oh, you lost. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> I just have two quick questions for you. Um, one question, I noticed on your maps um, uh -huh. that banks and samurai enclaves didn't really exist in Hokkaido. Um, and I was wondering if there was a, a, like a historical reason for that and if that plays in at all in your perception of how Hokkaido has kind of developed a little bit differently than the rest of Japan. Um, second question, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the convertibil convertibility of the notes in particular, and if they were at will, or if they were converted after a certain time period, just to kind of understand the incentives that someone that held a note um, had um, during that period. Okay. Um, again, good questions. So the first question is trying to understand the geographical dispersion in banks. Hokkaido is just, it's, it's relatively sparsely populated. And um, during that early period of fighting with the shogunate regime, there's a, um, a runaway republic set up in Hokkaido called Enzo. And they are kind of, again, a holdout of the, the forces loyal to the shogunate, not to the Satsuma. This is much earlier. They go up there, and they um, are hiding, in part because it's sparsely populated. So my sense is it just had low, low population density, and there was no financial development there because there were a few people living there, and after that, a holdout goes. Those people, I, I'm guessing, I can't say it, certainly probably move back to where there's sources of um, employment and those sorts of things. So that, that's one question. Um, the other one, um, let's see. The, uh, remind me, what was it? Oh, yeah, so the convertibility of the, of the notes. So you mean the, the bonds themselves, right? So most, a lot of bonds in this period had a lottery provision in them. This might be what you're alluding to. And so there was, I think, 1% a, a, a of the bonds um, were randomly drawn in the lottery, and they could be redeemed ahead of time. Um, it turns out the, the government made whole on these bonds. You go forward 30 years, and I found in an um, in, um, uh, English-language newspaper the last payments being made on those bonds. So they never defaulted on the bonds. They paid them off. Um, but there was some lottery risk to um, you know, basically buying back the bonds early. And that was a standard kind of provision in, um, in public debt in the 19th century. You would see that in most bonds floated in for example, in the London Stock Exchange, which was where most uh, sovereign debt was being issued in that era. Um, yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> Two questions right in a row. So there's Miles, and then you can hand it back behind you, and, and there's another question. Interesting things. One, by, by letting them set up banks, they were effectively giving them not only the money promised by the bond, but some seniorage, because, because they you know, effectively had the ability to create credit. So that's, that's an interesting part of it. I, and, I, and I wonder a little bit whether somehow this, this decentralization of, of the, what were government resources, now they're spread around in all these castle towns, maybe that helped development too. And, then uh, the, the last thought I had was there, 
there are a couple of other interesting examples of this kind of a political coalition, one from the US past and one from the future. But the, of course, Alexander Hamilton converted the state debt into That's national right. debt so that people would then want the national government to stay in existence. Then um, one of a recent paper by Larry Kotlikoff and co-authors is, uh, you know, he doesn't actually talk about the exact mechanisms, but it, it would be like um, having, having the, the, the government give everybody in the United, everybody in, in the United States and in other major countries bonds that were supposed to be paid off from the, the revenues from carbon taxes in the future so that people would then want to have carbon taxes so that their carbon tax bonds could be, and, and, and part of the idea is that the, you know, people talk about, oh, we should reduce CO2 emissions to help people in the future. Right. But, and, but Larry is arguing you can actually make everybody better off if, the, if effectively the people in the, using these financial tools you talked about, if the people in the future are compensating the folks in the present for the, for the difficulties of reducing CO2 emissions, you can make everybody better off. Yeah, that's, those are great ideas. In fact, on the last point, uh, I received a phone call of another colleague of mine, um, Joe Mason, and he, he and I had talked about my research, and he, he's a professor at Louisiana State, and he was having a meeting with, he had just testified in front of Congress, and he's like, I need your samurai paper. I'm trying to convince uh, senators from Louisiana that we could have contingent claims to, you know, to help with issues around climate change and global warming. Can you send me the paper? And I said, well, maybe we better write a white paper that just really kind of extracts it from the samurai case and talks about contingent claims and how these are useful, which is the general point here, right? This is the historical case, and you're making a general point that you can think about clever financial instruments to make intergenerational transfers or transfers among different groups of people, and that's exactly the idea. I think these are powerful tools for building coalitions to support reform, and it doesn't have to be wholesale you know, reform for modernization it could be something that we, from, from a policy perspective, we care about, but we might be able to target even better, you know, something narrower. Um, regarding, you know, kind of thinking of the, um, the, um, the bonds as a distribution of um, resources to different communities, that's exactly right. I mean, it's kind of a Bernanke helicopter drop, but it's a heterogeneous treatment effect, and what's really neat, it's based on pre meiji conditions. So they're not distributing it based on how they view the world. They rather took the, the samurai order and said, OK, the samurai get this distribution. So it's a nice predetermined treatment effect. And what we compare it to are castle towns that don't get banks. So if you thought it was just a pure samurai's getting money effect, then the castle towns that didn't get banks should grow as fast as the ones that did get banks, and they don't. And so that's why we think the banks are, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're using, the, to your third point, they're, they're basically um, fractional reserve banks. They're leveraging and they're creating credit. And that credit is being used to create new local um, firms, silk reeling and other sorts of things. Yes. Well, so my question is related to that uh, in terms of pre-bank initial conditions of the regions mm -hmm. that got banks, whereas um, the samurais may have settled in areas where it's fertile for rice and they have money to collect from peasants. Mm -hmm. And by having a castle, that may have led to commerce being established in the castle right. towns. Right. So we would, we would be concerned that castle towns actually, unlike what I'm saying here, which is all the negative things about castle towns, you're concerned, wait, they were actually... Um, places of economic development beforehand. And so in a standard growth regression kind of approach, we would take an initial income per capita as a control variable, right? And we put that on the right-hand side. And so our approach for doing that in a regression is to take the initial population, town population pre-banking 1873, kind of nice because we have it in the Meiji period, but before they're banked, use that as our initial control for development where Development in all this is being proxied by population. It's the best we can do. It would be great to have startups of firms, right? That's what a microeconomist would really tell us to do. You know, go get firm startups, and I would agree. Wonderful data. If only we could, you know, find it. Um, and so that's our control, and it's exactly meant to kind of address those preconditions because they would be um, they would be problematic. 
So that's our, that's our attempt to do that. Yeah, that's a good, good idea. So I wanna, I'm gonna ask a question or two. Uh, just two, um, but to sort of like bring it back to like thinking about like sort of these these lessons that can be that can be learned. So one one sort of issue that I can sort of see uh, coming up that this particular solution might be useful for, and, and one that faces Western societies that have gone through a fertility transition, which is that their demographics tend to look sort of pretty weird. Like you know, with big populations, say now of old people who, I mean, in some sense. We have to figure out, like, you know, if you want reform, right? Like, if you wanted to do social security reform, right? Like, you have to figure out how, like, how to pay those people um, the claim so that they you're essentially kind of like figure out a way to buy their votes. And so, I wonder how, like, sort of in a broad way, like demographics, you can think about like that as a challenge to be overcome by this. And then, sort of more focused on finance. So, in you, you mean you know a lot about this, and I wonder, sort of, in the history of like financial reform, like when that has taken place, you know, beginning with the glorious revolution to today. Like, do people, do, do, do governments adopt non-Western financial institutions? Like, what is like the, the, the case of that? Or does it seem to be that the sort of the direction is like, you know, sometimes they, they pick the weird ones, like the national banking system, uh, for, for, maybe, for maybe a good reason, but that it's, it's usually sort of saying, like, we need to go to, these places um, that 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 maybe happen to be Western um, in thinking about uh, you know doing financial reform. I mean, I just saw like so the Chinese central bank is going to start announcing uh, like they're going to try to do try to behave more like the Federal Reserve in providing you know whatever forward guidance, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, they're not doing something else, right? They're they're trying to look more like mm -hmm. these these Western financial institutions and less like you know something that's more feudal. Um, so I, I wondered if you had any thoughts on, on sort of that, that path of reform. So uh, it's hard to do the general sweep of history comment and reply to that. I mean, if we were to look at early scholars writing about growth, some of whom were intimately involved in post-war American planning, someone like Walt Rostow, they had these theories around stages of economic development. And they would use, they would contrast, say, the American model with um, developed capital markets with uh, you know, and small, more unit banks and commercial banks with a much more statist on the other extreme, a statist development, say, um, something like in um, pre-Soviet Russia, right? And so there, I think there's no universal adoption. I mean, my short answer would be um, clearly all countries aren't adopting best best institutions, or we would, if, if you believed in institutions mattering, we would have a lot more growth su successes than disasters. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that there's a, a singular answer to that question. Um, I would say that, that um, one would hope, as someone who's optimistic about policy, that there is social learning and that this isn't the only example of social learning. And that there are other examples where um, the willingness of countries to, to experiment um, is, is uh, part, of, uh, part of how we learn about what works. And I think the you know, the, the system we have in the United States where we allow a lot of experimentation at the state level is just that. We learn a lot, so the, the history of financial institutions in this country would say that we had non, we had um, non-uniform bank regulation and supervision, and we learned a lot about what worked and what didn't work through that um, period of states having a lot of jurisdiction over, um, over um, uh, bank regulation and supervision. And so, that kind of policy experiment, um, letting a thousand flowers bloom, is, can be quite useful. Um, so even when we talk of homogeneity, the U.S. national banking system was the really the the first attempt to to lay out a, a homogeneous system within the U.S. in terms of a bank regulation and supervision system. And that, as I said, it the U.S. case is peculiar because many other scholars of U.S. financial history would say there were pernicious effects of the US national banking system. It's not as if it was the best system out there. It was just a system out there that had a features that were particularly useful for these reformers. And so I don't, I, I don't think they thought all features of it were great, but this one fit their, fit their needs. Um, 
Transition costs on something like Social Security, I think, could be interesting. Kalikov would be the other person who's written a lot about those transition costs and how to do that. But maybe you could design some financial claims to compensate losers. I, I'd have to think more carefully about that. But it's an interesting area you could think about um, the demographic um, challenges that advanced economies and um, economies that have already gone through the demographic transition are facing. Yeah. Thank you very much for the excellent questions.